This lecture is an introduction to uh, the Mass Media Unit for AQA Sociology A-Level. It is not necessarily content you will be assessed directly on, but is there to provide a foundation to the unit itself and a bit of background that will come into some of your assessed work, but is more general understanding. So we're going to talk about what we mean by mass media, the different types of mass media and how they're characterised, and then the role that the media plays in society according to the functionalist, conflict, interactionist and postmodernist perspectives. So we'll start off by looking at what we mean by media or mass media. And in general, we're talking about forms of mass communication, communication that reaches large audiences. So we're not talking about one to one interactions such as conversations or text messages or letters or anything like that. We're talking about communication on a large scale and that large scale is huge. We're not talking school level, we're talking community, societal global level. So we're talking about things like the internet, the printed press, television, radio, etc. But that's a very simplistic way of looking at it. And we need to differentiate between media and mass media a little bit more in detail. So we're going to look at two um, sociological definitions. The first comes from Dutton et al. from the 1990s, and they identify four ways that mass media is different from one to one communication. And the first thing they talk about is distance. And what they're meaning here is that mass media is one way. It is from the creator to the audience. There isn't any interaction there and it generally lacks immediacy. So it's created separately and then released. It is also sent out via technology such as a television, a receiver, satellite, cable, things like that. And the scale, meaning multiple people, many people, thousands of people can watch all at the same time or listen all at the same time. And it is a commodity. It is there to create money. We are in a capitalist society after all. So the, the idea of mass media is the create. It, it, it's a commodity. It's something that creates money, whether that be through TV subscriptions, cost of a TV, buying a TV itself, um, subscription services, licensing or buying the product itself. Even in today's society where we have subscription services and streaming services and things like that, you're still supposed to pay for them. But the thing to remember about Dutton's um, definition is coming in the early 90s before mass Internet usage, before streaming services existed. We had cable, we had satellite TV, but we didn't have streaming services. Netflix wasn't around. Uh, it was still, I think around that time, it was still probably Love Film where you would be posted DVDs um, and you would return post them. You didn't have Spotify. You didn't have Amazon Prime. None of these things existed in the early 90s. So we this definition has had to evolve. And this is where we get to McCullough I think I'm pronouncing that right, in 2002. Now, again, the internet is still very early days here. It's not, it's around, but again, not in the way that we see it today. And McCullough says that um, mass media is a means through which content, whether fact or fiction, is produced by an organization and transmitted to be, and to, and received by an audience. And what he's talking about here or what they're talking about here is that it is created not by an individual, but by a company or an, a group of people. Now, obviously, again, this has developed and we'll talk about new media in the next lecture. 
but it is the idea that this group, this um, organization have created and sent out their media to be received by an audience. So it's talking, he breaks it down to three aspects. The production of messages, where this company is creating a message, whether that be factual or fictional, content of media messages, and reception of media messages by the audience. So it's a, again, it's still keeping that one way distance between the producer and the audience. Now we know with interactivity and um, that we see today, things have changed since, but we'll look at that more in the next lecture when we're looking at new media. So what are forms of media? Well, there are lots of different ways that media can be classified. The first way is through age. So you, this is where you have your traditional medias, such as theater, television, radio, newspapers, and you have new media, which is more digital. So this is coming from um, internet, streaming services, mobile phones, satellite technology. So the traditional medias are more physical, if you like, and analog. Television stations, going to the theatre, going to the cinema, listening to the radio, buying a newspaper or a magazine or a book. Whereas new media is more instantaneous. Downloading a book onto your Kindle or a tablet, um, streaming through your computer, your laptop, your TV. Um, so the digital, the new media is more digitized compared to traditional media. But we can also look at how media is distributed. So it could be broadcast. And here we're talking about the, the, the kind of traditional thing in sending out the media through the TV, through the radio, through the cinema, through the theater, through satellite or cable television but it is received in a more auditory and visual component. Then we have digital media, which again, we've talked about. This is our streaming services, the internet, um, YouTube type media, or through digitized reading, through e-readers and online newspapers. It's digital radio which is all sent through digital rather than analog means. And then finally, you have your print media, which is still around today and still doing relatively well. You have paper newspapers where people physically go and buy a newspaper, magazines, books, um, posters. All of these are a print media format. They are physical. You hold them in your hands. But either way, media is vast. There are lots of different forms of it. There are lots of different um, ways we can consume it. But I think the big thing to remember here is for it to be me mass media, it needs to be consumed by large numbers of people, but also simultaneously. That not necessarily automatically simultaneous, but it can be done simultaneously. So why does the media exist? What is its purpose? Why, why do we have it? Now, before we get into the sociological perspectives on this, there is a more general view of the media, which I think is important for us to understand. So the first purpose of the media is to educate. It's to inform. It's to give us information. Think documentaries, podcasts, books the internet, we learn things from the media. Sometimes true, sometimes not true, but we, we learn using media. But it also influences us. It influences culture. It influences our identities, our choices in our consumer um, actions. It influences fashion. It influences music. It, inf it plays a part in telling us what is popular, what is not. 
it gives us access to cultures and um, other cultural things that we wouldn't necessarily have had access to which can then influence our lifestyles it can change our social attitudes learning then this links these, these are all interlinked they're not necessarily um separated but the education side of things can also influence us and finally and this is the one that people mostly think about when they think media it's about entertaining us it takes our minds away from the realities of life we can watch a film or listen to music or read a book and lose ourselves in a fictional world where the problems of day-to-day -day life no longer exists we go and watch films because we enjoy them they entertain us so the entertainment side is about enjoyment we consume media that we enjoy i enjoy horror films i watch a lot of them but i'm also educated by those horror films it teaches me about folklore about um paranormal stories and myths and legends and it influences other things that i buy i may see something in a horror film think, oh i like that outfit i'm gonna go in and buy it so that entertainment side of things does also lead into the um influence and education side of things there are there are and i do know that we there are things that we watch that just because they're mind candy we watch them we consume them read or um, listen to things because we don't have to think about it but there is subtext there that educates and influences so each of these purposes does interlink and interweave even if our primary purpose isn't what we're also getting out of it but sociologists obviously look at this a little bit more deeply and come at it from their different perspectives so if we look at the functionalists first we know that the functionalists are a consensus structural approach they look at the institutions of society and how they're interlinked and interwoven in order to benefit society and that's still the same with the media so here we have a key thinker charles r wright and he said that the media is an essential part of helping to maintain social cohesion within society it isn't a cornerstone but it is an essential part of ensuring that society functions and it does this by acting as an agent of socialization it is a secondary agent of socialization which um, reinforces the primary socialization but it's also in a way of linking back to parsons theory of bridging it does take a part of that bridging effect in showing the universalistic values that people need to adhere to showing what is acceptable behavior within society but also the consequences of unacceptable behavior we are able to watch tv shows listen to music read in books the what what is allowed and what is not allowed within society and with that in mind it also acts as an agent of social control it is an informal agent of social control which shows as i said the consequences of our not following the norms and values of society what happens when we don't do the things that society tells us that we should do whether that be more leading to more formal social control such as um arrest or punishment or through ostracization and marginalization the informal social controls that society maintains but the media is a way of transmitting that information to society as a whole saying if you behave in this way this is what could happen to you 
So it's a safety agent of social control, if you like. But it can also act as a form of catharsis. And what this means is it's an outlet. As I've said, I enjoy horror films. But I don't go out and kill people or go to haunted houses and things like that. But the media, is, it help, it provides a safe scare. It provides a way for me to feel fear safely because at the end of the day, it's a film, it's a book, it's a radio show, it's a, it's music. It's safe because it's not real. But violent video games can provide a catharsis when people are feeling frustrated. And that helps maintain social cohesion because people are taking out their frustrations in a way that does not impact society, that does not lead to a um, formal form of social control. It doesn't lead to anime within society. You have that release that allows people to then continue following the norms and values of society. So for the functionalist, the media provides safety and social cohesion. It reminds us of the norms and values. It reminds us of the boundaries that are in place in society if we don't follow those norms and values and it provides a release for social frustrations um, that mean that we can all coexist in a happy and safe environment. The conflict view however and this is the work of Thomas J Sullivan and this covers both Marxism and feminism as you remember will be uh, who are our structural conflict theories. Now they argue that the media is controlled by corporations and the ruling class to satisfy their own agendas. So we're looking at how the media, yes it maintains social cohesion, but it's not an equal social cohesion. And so they argue that the media acts as a conduit for social coercion. It is a manipulation. It manipulates us into behaving in certain ways through being a, uh, an agent of socialization, but it's manipulating us into believing that society is a certain way and we should behave in a certain way because that's how society is. So it's manipulating us into believing the, according to the Marxists, the capitalist agenda. And according to the feminists, uh, believing the patriarchal agenda that keeps the working class and the ruling class separated, keeps women oppressed by men. And it also acts as an agent of social control in the same way that we said for the functionalists, that these, the, the media says, if you do not follow this ruling class agenda, this um patriarchal agenda this is what could happen to you and a good example of this from a, a feminist perspective is there is a film that came out oh god years and years ago Sarah Jessica Parker film called I don't know how she does it and feminists argue that this film is a patriarchal agenda setting film it's about a woman who has a high powered career. She has a family. She has everything that feminists argue we should have. But then shows that she's not a she's unable to do things, these things properly, that, that, that she has to drop a plate, if you like. And by the end of the film, without ruining any of it, she gives up the high powered career to be a better mother. And the agenda, the social control here, the informal social control here is saying that she needs to put her family above her career because otherwise she'll lose her family and then she won't feel as um, fulfilled. And there is, the feminists will argue that the media perpetuates this belief that in order for a woman to be fulfilled, she must be 
a mother, she must have family. And yet men are portrayed as being completely fulfilled with a high powered career and the family, but not necessarily being as involved in that family. And the, the Marxists argue that this agent of social control as the media as an agent of social control is sending out the message of you need to buy more. You need to have more. You need to this bigger, better thing, this new thing, this wonderful thing that has become out that if you want to you want to be successful, you need to have this thing. And that all leads into the maintenance of social inequality. It shows us a for the Marxists, it shows us a lifestyle that we should aim for that um, bourgeoisie lifestyle, the, the consumerist lifestyle of I want what they have, keeping up with the Joneses. And in order to do that, we continue going to work and being exploited by the capitalist system and going out and earning all this money so that we can buy these things that the media is telling us that we should want. So for the conflict view, the media is a way of controlling society to maintain social inequality. Now, the interactionists come at the media from a very different perspective. They see the media as a means by which we can understand our realities. It helps to shape our understanding of reality through symbols. Now, if you remember back to your understanding of interactionism and symbolic interactionism, a symbol is a gesture, a body language, a facial expression that, that we interpret to therefore understand what's happening around us. And the media helps us to do that by showing us these symbols. It shows us a gesture and how others interact with that gesture so that we know what we should and shouldn't do when we are faced with that symbol. And it does this through sharing interactions. We, if you remember back, we learn how to interact with others by seeing reactions, seeing how others interact with each other and, and learning from that. So the media shows us these interactions, it shares these interactions with us so that if we are faced with similar scenarios and similar situations, we then know how to react to them. We see it, we emulate it. Uh, to, to crudely put it, monkey see, monkey do. Um, and that helps us to interact with each other on a societal basis because we see people interacting and that can help when you're entering new societies if you have um watched culturally um based media or read about culture you'll know what is appropriate such as learning that when in eastern societies it is appropriate to bow to say hello and you bow lower than the person who is in authority or whether they be more elderly or um, financially more um, authority than you there is that you learn you can learn that by watching or interacting with media which but it also helps to share social values the media provides us with examples of what is socially acceptable as a goal in society it shows us those social goals what we should be aiming for it to be successful within society and we can internalize those values and and therefore interact within society and so for the interactionists the media provides us with those social interactions in a safe play way that we can then emulate within wider society. Now, the postmodernists take a different view 
as well. The postmodernists see the media as creating false reality, which can later on become true. So they see the, the, the media as a way of sharing a meta narrative, sharing a big picture story that isn't necessarily the reality of yourself or of a society. And Bulriard, gentleman in the picture, says, talks about Simulacara. And what he means by Simulacara is that the media is creating a false simulation, um, that is creating a false reality. And a good example here is fake news and how people internalize that fake news and create their own sense of reality around that fake story. Um, and we've seen a lot of fake news in, in recent years and a lot of reality, real news actually called out as fake news when it doesn't fit someone's idea of reality. And this similar car, this simulation is what Bulriard says the media does to it's not even doing it, it's creating this simulation where people can't tell the difference between reality and fiction, what he refers to as hyper reality. And a good example of hyper reality is these um, reality TV shows, the scripted reality of the Kardashians and TOWIE and Made in Chelsea and all these other shows that have been created within the, the, the media to show us a lifestyle that's not true, but people believe it to be true. A good example is with the Kardashians. There were pictures of them in magazines and online of them filming their Christmas special in October. Sh absolutely showing that this show was not real. It was created the life that they are showing in the show is created for the viewer yet there are many people who believe the the reality more than the fiction of these tv shows so the postmodernists see the media as creating a false reality that if enough people believe it to be true it can become true so very, very quickly, that is our introduction to the media, the different forms of media and how they're categorised and the perspectives view on the media.